The Peregrine by J. A. Baker To My Wife Part 1 Beginnings East of my home, the long ridge lies across the skyline like the low hole of a submarine. Above it, the eastern sky is bright with reflections of distant water, and there is a feeling of sails beyond land. Hill trees mass together in a dark, spired forest, but when I move towards them, they slowly fan apart. The sky descends between, and they are solitary oaks and elms, each with its own wide territory of winter shadow. The calmness, the solitude of horizons lures me towards them, through them, and on to others. They layer the memory like strata, from the town, the river flows northeast, bends east round the north side of the ridge, turns south to the estuary. The upper valley is a flat open plain, lower down it is narrow and steep-sided. Near the estuary, it is again flat and open. The plain is like an estuary of land, scattered with island farms. The river flows slowly, meanders. It is too small for the long, wide estuary, which was once the mouth of a much larger river that drained most of Middle England. Detailed descriptions of landscape are tedious. One part of England is superficially so much like another. The differences are subtle, colored by love. The soil here is clay, boulder clay to the north of the river, London clay to the south. There is gravel on the river terraces and on the higher ground of the ridge. Once, a fo once forest, then pasture, the land is now mainly arable. Woods are small with few large trees, chiefly oak standards with hornbeam or hazel coppice. Many hedges have been cut down those that still stand are of hawthorn, blackthorn, and elm. Elms grow tall in the clay. Their varying shapes contour the winter sky. Cricket bat willows mark the river's course. Alders line the brook. Hawthorn grows well. It is a count country of elm and oak and thorn. People native to the clay are surly and slow to burn morose and smoldering as alder wood, like conic, heavy as the land itself. There are 400 miles of tidal coast. If all the creeks and islands are included, it is the longest and most irregular county, county coastline. It is the driest county, yet watery edged, flaking down to marsh and salting and mud flats. The drying sandy mud of the ebb tide makes the sky clear above. Clouds reflect water and shine it back inland. Farms are well ordered, prosperous, but a fragrance of neglect still lingers like a ghost of fallen grass. There is always a sense of loss, a feeling of being forgotten. There is nothing else here, no castles, no ancient monuments. No hills like green clouds. It is just a curve of the earth, a rawness of winter fields, dim, flat, desolate lands that cauterize all sorrow. I have always longed to be a part of the outward life, to be out there at the edge of things, to let the human taint wash away in emptiness and silence as the fox sloughs his smell into the cold underworldliness of water, to return to the town as a stranger. Wandering flushes a glory that fades with arrival. I came late to the love of birds. For years I saw them only as a tremor at the edge of vision. They know suffering and joy in simple states not possible for us. Their lives quicken and warm to a pulse our hearts can never reach. They race to oblivion. They are old before we have finished growing. 
The first bird I searched for was the night jar, which used to nest in the valley. Its song is like the sound of a stream of wine spilling from a height into a deep and booming cask. It is an odorous sound with a bouquet that rises to the quiet sky. In the glare of day, it would seem thinner and drier, but dusk mellows it and gives it vintage. If a song could smell, this song would smell of crushed grapes and almonds and dark wood. The sound spills out and none of it is lost. The whole, the whole wood brims with it, then it stops, suddenly, unexpectedly. But the ear hears it still, a prolonged and fading echo draining and winding it out among the surrounding trees into the deep stillness between the early stars and the long afterglow, the night jar leaps up joyfully. It glides and flutters, dances and bounces lightly, silently away. In pictures, it seems to have a frog-like despondency, a mournful aura as though it were sepulchred in twilight, ghostly and disturbing. It is never like that in life. Through the dusk, one sees only its shape and its flight, intangibly light and gay, graceful and nimble as a swallow. Sparrow hawks were always near to me, near me in the dusk, like something I meant to say but could never quite remember. Their narrow heads glared blindly through my sleep. I pursued them for many summers but they were always too they were always hard to find and harder to see being so few and so wary they lived a fugitive gorilla life in the in all the overgrown neglected places the frail bones of generations of sparrow hawks are sifting down now into the deep hummus of the woods they were a banished race of beautiful barbarians and when they died, they could not be replaced. I have turned away from the musky opulence of the summer woods, where so many birds are dying. Autumn begins my season of hawk hunting. Spring ends it. Winter glitters between like the arch of Orion. I saw my first peregrine on a December day at the estuary ten years ago. The sun reddened out the white river mist. Fields glittered with rime. Boats were encrusted with it. Only the gentle lapping water moved freely and shone. I went along the high river wall towards the sea. The stiff crackling white grass became limp and wet as the sun rose through a clear sky into dazzling mist. Frost stayed all day in shaded places and the sun was warm, there was no wind. I rested at the foot of the wall and watched Dunlin feeding at the tide line. Suddenly they flew upstream and hundreds of finches fluttered overhead, whirling away with a hurr of desperate wings. Too slowly it came to me that something was happening, which I ought not to miss. I scrambled up and saw that the stunted hawthorns on the inland slope of the wall were full of field fairs. Their sharp bills pointed to the northeast, and they clacked and splur spluttered in alarm. I followed their point and saw a falcon flying towards me. It veered to the right and passed inland. It was like a kestrel, but bigger and yellower with a more bullet-shaped head, longer wings and greater zest and buoyancy of flight. It did not glide till it saw starlings feeding in stubble. Then it swept down and was hidden among them as they rose. A minute later, it rushed overhead and was gone in a breath into the sunlit mist. It was flying much higher than before, flinging and darting forwards with its sharp wings angled back and flicking like a snipe's. This was my first peregrine. 
I've seen many since then, but none has excelled it for speed and fire of spirit. For ten years I spent all my winters searching for that restless brilliance, for the sudden passion and violence that peregrines flush from the sky. For ten years I have been looking upward for that cloud-biting anchor shape, the cr that crossbow flinging through the air. The eye becomes insatiable for hawks. It clicks towards them with ecstatic fury, just as the hawk's eye swings and dilates to the luring food shapes of gulls and pigeons. To be recognized and accepted by a peregrine, you must wear the same clothes, travel by the same way, perform actions in the same order. Like all birds, it fears the unpredictable. Enter and leave the same fields at the same time each day. Soothe the hawk from its wildness by a ritual of behavior as invariable as its own. Hood the glare of the eyes, hide the white tremor of the hands, shade the stark reflecting face, assume the stillness of a tree. A peregrine fears nothing he can see clearly and far off. Approach him across open ground with a steady and faltering movement. Let your shape grow in size, but do not alter its outline. Never hide yourself unless concealment is complete. Be alone. Shun the furtive oddity of man. Cringe from the hostile eyes of farms. Learn to fear. To share fear is the greatest bond of all. The hunter must become the thing he hunts. What is, is now, must have the quivering intensity of an arrow thudding into a tree. Yesterday is dim and monochrome. A week ago, you were not born. Persist, endure, follow, watch. Hawk hunting sharpens vision, pouring away behind the moving bird. The land flows out from the eye in deltas of piercing color. The angled eye strikes through the surface dross as the obliqued axe cuts to the heart of a tree. A vivid sense of place grows like another limb. Direction has color and meaning. South is a bright blocked place, opaque and stifling. West is a thickening of the earth into trees, a drop a drawing together the great beef side of England. The heavenly haunch, north is open, bleak, away to nothing. East is an awakening, is awakening the sky, a beckoning of light, a storming suddenness of sea. Time is measured by a clock of blood. When one is active close to the hawk, pursuing the pulse races, Time goes faster when one is still, waiting. The pulse quietens. Time is slow. Always, as one hunts for the hawk, one has an oppressive sense of time contracting inwards like a tightening spring. One hates the movement of the sun and steady alteration of the light, the increase of hunger, the maddening metronome of the heartbeat. When one says 10 o'clock or 3 o'clock, this is not the gray and shrunken time of towns. It is the memory of a certain fulmination or declension of light that was unique to that time and that place on that day. A memory as vivid to the hunter as burning magnesium. As way of the wind, he feels the weight of the air. Far within himself, he seems to see the hawk stay growing steadily towards the light of their first encounter. Time and the weather hold both hawk watcher between the tur their turning poles. When the hawk is found, the hunter can look lovingly back at all the tedium and misery of searching and waiting that went before. All is transfigured as though the broken columns of a ruined temple had suddenly resumed their ancient splendor. I shall try to make plain the bloodiness of killing. Too often this has been slurred over by those who defend hawks. Flesh-eating man is in no way superior. It is so easy to love the dead. The word predator is baggy with misuse. 
All birds eat living flesh at some time in their lives. Consider the cold Consider the cold-eyed thrush, that springy carnivore of, of lawns, worm stabber, basher to death of snails. We should not sentimentalize his song and forget the killing that sustains it. In my diary of a single winter, I have tried to preserve a unity, binding together the bird, the watcher, and the place that holds them both. Everything I described took place while I was watching it, but I do not believe that honest obs observation is enough. The emotions and behavior of the watcher are also facts, and they must be truthfully recorded. For ten years, I followed the peregrine. I was possessed by it. It was a grail to me. Now it has gone. The long pursuit is over. Few peregrines are left. There will be fewer. They may not survive. Many die on their backs, clutching insanely at the sky in their last convulsions, withered and burnt away by the filthy, insidious pollen of farm chemicals. Before it is too late, I have tried to recapture the extraordinary beauty of this bird and to convey the wonder of the land he lived in, a land to me as profuse and glorious as Africa. It is a dying world like Mars but growing still.